Hello everyone, welcome to G2E Asia. We're with Bill Miller, CEO and President of the American Gaming Association. Welcome, Bill. Well, Philip, thank you for having me. It's great to have you here. And uh, you had a great keynote yesterday. Thank Enjoyed you. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, today's topic for this interview, we're gonna talk about responsible gaming. Right. We're gonna talk about exciting things happening in Asia. We're even gonna talk a little bit about technology and AI. Excellent. Um, but before we get started, Bill, you know, watching you the past five years, because you came into gaming from uh, the Association for CEOs. That's right, Business Roundtable. Business Roundtable, the top 500 companies. You had 200 and... 204 Fortune 500 CEO bosses. Stressful every day. That's not an easy job. <laughs> and then when you came into gaming, shortly thereafter, there was a stressful moment. Stressful moments, many of them with COVID. Uh, it was really quite an incredible experience that yeah, really yeah. everyone in the world had, but in the gaming space, it was particularly difficult. Um, you know, and, and I think about it as a, as a leader, it was, it was, this is my first CEO job. And so I had had very senior positions in other organizations, but it was my job to help lead the industry through the pandemic. Bill, you did it. What? With some help, you yep. have a great team. We do. The industry is great, but something I'm curious about: you have some good mental fitness. You must do things to manage your stress. What are your own personal <sighs> ways well, <clears throat> of behind the scenes? What are you doing to take care of Bill? Um, I, I think for me, um, mental health is incredibly important. You know, it's it, it's at least as important as physical health, and I I, I work very much on trying to make sure that there's balance, that I create some mental and physical balance and try and manage stress levels. Recognizing that at different points in your life, whether they be personal or professional, stress can become an overwhelming thing. And so um, I do spend time almost every day to meditate. I spend a little bit of time just reflecting and trying to be in a quiet moment. Uh, and sometimes it's at work and sometimes it's at home. But it, try and prioritize it as something that I do every day. <laughs> well, you, you, you talked about you know, that period of time in COVID and you know, we, are a we are a reasonably you know, strong trade association, but was heavily, still somewhat, dependent upon trade shows as part of our revenue. And obviously for two years, there were no trade shows. I mean, it's incredibly exciting to be back here in Macau for the 15th anniversary of the starting, the first G2E Asia. But there was a point in time when all that money was had dried up. I still want to make sure that I take care of the people that work so hard for the AGA and then make sure that we are trying to influence policymakers about the importance of supporting the gaming industry in the same way that we were, the governments were trying to support other businesses and other constituencies. And for the first time ever, we actually were treated the same as other businesses. That was actually a feat in a way. Uh, probably a validation to a certain degree yeah. about the industry. I know the pandemic was not a good experience for anyone, no. but in a way, in a weird way, it did give some validation to gaming because there was some assistance to casinos when they shut down, right? It, it was quite incredible. And, and, and I think when I look back at it, and I think about the AGA, 26 years now. This was, an, this was an organization and an industry that was protected by almost one singular figure, Senator Harry Reid of Nevada. He's passed, he was a great leader for Nevada, great leader for the gaming industry, <clears throat> but it was also a dangerous reliance because whenever you're relying on one individual or even just a couple of individuals for your political and policy fortunes, it can be challenging. And I think what we saw during COVID is because the gaming industry in the US has become so mainstream, we have over a thousand casinos in America, both commercial and tribal. People in communities all over the country have seen the economic renaissance in cities and towns that got left behind by the auto industry or by the steel industry. And when they may have had their doubts about the casinos when they came, but when they came, they came with jobs, they came with high taxes, uh, they came with economic reinvestment in communities that had been dormant 
for literally decades. And so that story really allowed many legislators, many senators from states that were not, are not traditionally considered gaming states to step up and say, you know what, these guys should be treated the same as everybody else. You brought up an example, even more on a granular, granular level at a community where there was even uh, the fire department. Yes. Uh, they wanted new trucks new for so truck. long. Yep. And it wasn't until gaming arrived mm -hmm. where they got what they've been wanting for years, new I, trucks. I think about that in all of these, these, these stories and the, the, the transformation that we, we help facilitate. You know, it's, it's not just, okay, there's a casino and it's a new opportunity for people to have having a good time. It's a creation of good paying jobs and careers. And then it's the echo effect. It's what else happens. The florist who may have been struggling before now is, has a new stream of revenue because the casino wants flowers every day. The fire department has a new stream of local taxes that help facilitate them buying that next fire truck. The, you know, the mayor or town supervisor says, you know what, we now have the, we now have the money to pave the roads and, and make improvements in, pu in public safety and those sorts of things. And so it's not just the mm -hmm. tax revenue and the jobs, which are incredibly important, but the echo effect and the amplification of that economic benefit that has given us really what we see today in the U.S., record public approval of our industry. On the public <clears throat> approval part, not only publicly, but government, uh, yeah. where politics can be somewhat polarizing these days in of the U.S., course, yeah. but it seems that both actually kind of agree, of agree in the most cases that gaming is a pretty good idea. It's mainstream. I think that I think it's that's the way I, I think about it is, you know, this industry started in a very colorful manner, right? It was the mob and Teamster pension funds. And that's what happened in Las, Las Vegas. There was visionaries, but those visionaries were, you know, kind of on the shadier side of the business. We have seen a complete turnover in America where now it's not seen as Bugsy Siegel and, and, and that, but it's seen as an important part of people's entertainment dollars. And so w why has that happened? That's happened because of what we've meant in these communities and how we've transformed the lives of people that didn't have economic opportunity. There's really no better story in America than how it's happened in tribal world, right? Native Americans in the U.S. have been treated worse than probably any other group of people in America other than, you know, Africans who were, who were dragged to America as slaves. In, in the case of America, when Europeans came, they pushed them off into reservations and they became beggars to the federal government until they were allowed to become self-sufficient. And many of them have become incredibly successful. But it's only really two generations away from people living in dirt floors and no electricity and no running water. And so to see the transformation and the public support around that has been really, really incredible. Yeah, it's, it's lifted the economies of certain areas of America that were overlooked and forgotten for too long. And, and to your point on politics, look, I've spent most of my life either in government, advising government, and politics, and to think about sports betting from when the Supreme Court ruled that Nevada should not be the only state in America to have a monopoly on legal sports betting to 40 states and the District of Columbia being legal. These are not all Republican states or all Democrat states. These are many states that have mixed government, a Republican governor and Democrat legislature, or the opposite. And as you rightly put it, this is a, these are hyper-political times. And so even in a hyper-political time, these states said, look, my constituents have been betting on sports as long as they're in sports to bet on. Why shouldn't I create some consumer protections for them? And why shouldn't I create an opportunity for the state to benefit with, st with tax revenue and really create a holistic universe that creates and protects the integrity of the athletic contests while creating a more healthy environment for uh, the sports better? And like you said, they've been betting on sports for a very long time. Oh, yeah. And the fact of the matter is, and there's been a lot of 
critics that have surfaced about yeah. legal sports betting recently. Mm -hmm. You see it in the New York Times, you see it in the news. But I think the real conversation should be illegal sports betting. Yes. Because it's not like when legal sports betting comes to town, it creates a bunch of new gamblers. No. Yeah. They were probably already yeah. gambling. They were just doing it illegally. That's right. There was no tax revenue being generated. No new fire stations getting their no. uh, new trucks previously if they were in a state that was illegal That's sports right. betting. But can you kind of unwrap that a little bit? The relationship between illegal sports betting, legal sports betting, and responsible betting or responsible gaming. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I'm glad you asked the question because it responsible, responsible, responsibility in the gaming space and responsible uh, actions by people that are licensed um, is core to the industry. It started with the casinos, but in each opportunity when there is a new vertical in the industry that gets created, the same licensing and code of conduct remains. And that means that we as operators have to abide by a certain code of conduct as, as dictated by the statutes of the states in which we operate and under which the regulators hold us to account. And we do that because it's in our best interest to create a long-term sustainable industry that is not seen as predatory. And that is in deep and stark contrast from the illegal market that is predatory, that doesn't believe in consumer protection, and isn't have any association or ties to the communities in which they operate. And so it, it, the, the notion that, that when we were able to move sports betting, and there's been a lot of news about this, like, and, and part of it was about advertising and how much advertising, and is it too much advertising? Our view was always, if you have a entire nation of you know 330 million people and then subtract under 21 you have some huge number of people that have been betting illegally on sports unless they lived in the state of nevada so the notion that we are going to try and move them many of which who if it's on the internet and they can search it they believe it's legitimate and and that is that is a was a huge part of this but what we saw is in places like new york when it you know, it became legal in December, and and in less than one month, it became the biggest sports betting state in the country. All those people didn't decide one day to, you know what, that sports betting thing, I just saw an ad. I think that sounds fun, maybe I'll try it. No, of course not, that's incredibly naive. But it was advertising that allowed people to understand what are the legal options and why should they be in the legal market. The reason they should be in the legal market is because there is a legal f regulatory framework that demands activities that are protection or consumer oriented protections. None of this per act, act, it exists in the illegal market. And so I talk about it all the time, the value and importance of the legal market as contrasted to the illegal market and the illegal market being kind of in this offshore nether world where you know you can power up your your you can power up your account with a credit card and start betting immediately and no one cares if you've self-excluded because you have in the past had an issue or problem with gambling those people don't care those people also don't necessarily need to pay you if you win because where are you going to go and chase the money down curacao uh isle of man malta like and so the legal regulated market has built-in consumer protections that work. And then, you know, I'll just say one more thing about this, and what we've seen recently is we've seen some stories about athletes, right? You know, the, the, the most famous is the Shohei Otani's translator. And people, you know, and, and I, you know, take, take some kind of shot at the journalistic community because I think in some cases they uh, are not necessarily lazy, but there is a conflation of the illegal market and the advent of legal sports betting. And the reality is, in the Shohei Otani case, the guy was betting with an illegal sports book, but yet the stories turn into editorials about this is what happens when you've moved legal sports betting. Like, no, it was this is what happened. participating in the it, illegal side. And it was only right. the fact that, you know, that this was bank fraud, 
and that that's what caught this guy. Now, the case of Jonte Porter, the, the, the NBA basketball player, who actually went in the legal sports betting, he was caught and flagged because the system works. All of the issues that the leagues had when sports betting became legal were, wow, this is gonna create a great deal of strain on us as leagues and us as teams and arenas to make sure that we are protecting the integrity of our sport. Well, my view was, of course, that is one side of it. The other side is, there's a lot of financial benefit to the leagues, broadcasters, etc., because of sports betting from advertising. And so with the reward comes the responsibility. And so we in the industry that are licensed, that responsibility is natural to us because it came from us. It came from the same responsibility we have to our regulators in the casino and brick and mortar mm -hmm. to the same responsibility that we bring to sports betting. And our job is to continue to educate our ecosystem, i.e. the other people that are benefiting from sports betting but are not legally regulated because they are not license holders to make sure that we all have a vested interest in seeing sports betting go right in the U.S. No, it's great. You know, and I, I think that conversation when people or critics surface about sports betting, the conversation shifts to, should be on illegal. Yes. And how the benefits of it being legal really uh, are evident more and more so. On this note of responsible gaming, yes. September is Responsible Gaming Month for the yes. AGA. Can we touch on that for a moment? Yes, I'm, I think that I think that highlighting what the industry is doing and how we're working. Of course, you know we work with regulators, you know, in all parts of the country. I've had regulator meetings uh, here in Macau. But responsibility is baked into everything that we do because we do want to make sure that there is a strong responsibility message in, you know, in how we operate our businesses because there's no successful long-term gaming interest without putting responsibility on the front foot. And so responsibility, you know, uh, Responsible Gaming Month, uh, it used to be Responsible Gaming Education Week. Uh, we had so much content from our, from our member companies and from people in the industry about what they are doing with educating their employees, better understanding trends, and you know, and I know we're going to talk about AI and things like that, but there are a lot of things that we can continue to do to better understand betting behavior and when betting behavior becomes worrisome because at the end of the day, the operators do not want to make their money on people that have problem gambling issues. Mm -hmm. It comes back to the guest experience and perception and in the uh, atmosphere they want to create, a positive one. Uh, uh, Bill, on the topic of responsible gaming, yes. you're a parent, you have two boys, nine and 10? No, uh, yeah, nine They're and 10. They're still nine and 10, no They're birthdays nine. yet? Okay, no. um, so nine and 10. In, in part of the critics on legal sports betting and everything else is their yeah. children, but you are a dad. Huh? Yeah. Uh, what's the conversation, do you have conversations with them yet? or? Do you plan to yeah. about what do you say? Well, as I said before, that, like there's a lot of advertising out there that that advertising is intended to move, you know, legal age gamblers from the illegal market into the legal protected market, and that's important. But you know, when we're watching the NFL on Sundays, my kids are watching that, and they're saying, Dad. When can I get to do that? And I said, When you're old. In the same way, when there's a beer commercial on. I don't have, you know, I have the same conversation with them. They say, wow, Budweiser looks really delicious. Why well, can't I have it? Well, you can have it when you're of age. And I th so I think that there's an element of common sense and an element of parental responsibility that it should always be part of these things. Like, there are things that Driving, are legal. Driving, drinking, yes, whatever that yes, might be. There's legal. an age when, there are, there's a time when that comes, a, time a responsible place, decision. But, yeah, and, and, and we're not at a place, and maybe AI will be part of that, we, we're not at a place yet where the television senses who exactly is watching it and says, oh, there's children watching the television, so therefore I'm not going to allow certain broadcast ads. Look, we may get to a place where things are so tailored to the specifics, and, and certainly you know, on, online and, and meta or, and you know, Facebook, like the things that I want, the things that I've ever bought, 
you know, some golf improvement uh, device. I get a feed of them now because they know what my preferences are. But I think that at the end of the day, there is an element of common sense and parental responsibility that we all have to take seriously as parents. And that is, parent, you know, kids shouldn't be driving if they don't have licenses. They shouldn't be drinking if they're not of age. And they certainly shouldn't be using, they shouldn't be using, you know, gambling platforms unless and until they are of age and they understand what it's all about. Before we get to AI, yeah. uh, exciting things going on in Asia. What's the buzz? What are you hearing? What are the conversations like? Well, first, I mean, it's it's exciting to be back in Macau. It was, uh, you know, we had a we had a pause. We had some challenges with, uh, you know, COVID everywhere in the world. Um, but it's great to have this show in full here. We had a smaller version of the show here last year, but this is real G two E Asians back, and it's great. And so uh, that is exciting. But it's you know there are other exciting things that are happening. Um, you know. It, you know, there are shovels in the ground in Osaka, you know, and this was something that, you we know, were just there last week. Yeah, very, very, very difficult, long journey to get to this place. Um, but when that fin that thing is finished in 2030, it will be, it will be the iconic signature of that city in the same way this, the Sydney Opera House is for the city of Sydney in Australia. I think that I, you know, I leave here today to go to the UAE and, uh, the UAE is in win is in the process of uh, building an incredible property in Ras Al Khaimah, uh, which is probably an hour and twenty minutes outside of Dubai, and this will again be another step forward because the, these governments are recognizing the benefits where they used to see only the negative, they're now seeing the benefits, and now we're beginning to see that whether it's in Japan that had a long time resistance to this or in the Middle East, which, you know, historically has been, you know, quite uh, uh, antagonistic towards the gaming industry. And then in other places like Thailand and others, we're seeing movement forward. And I think it's, you know, we're, ju we're seeing that next wave of development, that next wave of investment. Uh, and I think quite candidly for us as, a, as an American gaming industry, that blueprint, that IR, the integrated resort blueprint, is really what these countries are looking for. They don't want just a casino. They want a casino that also caters to people that are non-gambling oriented. And that has been the successful model in America. And I think that will be the successful model going forward in these countries. You talked about the blueprint. And the blueprint in the US has how, how there's such a commitment to entertainment mm -hmm. and sport and art. As a matter of fact, here at G2E Asia, today's full day session breakout is on art and bringing sport to Macau yeah. and it leads into tomorrow and I think that blueprint that we see in the US it's probably attracting new markets like uh, the Middle East well I, th I think it's uh, you know it's so incredible to think about the the Super Bowl the NFL you know by far by far the most popular sport in the US and for a long, long time, the NFL had you know strong policies against gambling, strong policies against you know really even close alignment marketing, and we went from that to the you know the Raiders moving to uh, Las Vegas to the NFL draft being there, you know now NBA you know, NBA franchise may becomes the. Uh, NHL draft is going to happen this, you know, next month. Sports have this. Las Vegas has become not just the gambling center of America, but also the sports center of America, and that is a remarkable turnaround. And again, it speaks to the mainstream view of our industry that has evolved over time. And I think that in the same way it has evolved here, it will evolve in the same way because I think that. Uh, progressive thinking policymakers are looking at this in a holistic way and saying, all right, so gaming can provide the funding to build pretty large footprint, uh, multi-purpose multi en uh, entities with hotels and restaurants and show floors, but also arenas and stadiums so that it allows us to bring 
different elements to this particular location, and I think that that will continue. I, uh, I'm confident. Mm -hmm. And these centers you talk about, like Osaka, you see the renderings. It's amazing. Yeah, it really is. Uh, build AI. Yeah, sure. Well, what, what's the buzz about AI in, in gaming right now? Or what should we know? Well, I think it's, you know, we're still scratching the surface. I think every industry is scratching the surface on what AI is, what it can do, how it can be a benefit. But what I really feel very strongly about is AI can create the opportunity to better understand where people might have problem gambling tendencies and cut those off at the pass. And I think that you know, because the ability to process large data sets and, and find those triggering pieces, that will be a great benefit to an industry that, again, doesn't want to make its money off people with problem gambling issues. They want to, they want to have a healthy relationship with our, with, our client, with our customers because at the end of the day, people should look at this in the same way they look at any other entertainment. You know, going to a concert, going to a show, going to a restaurant. This is their discretionary income segment and we want to be a part of that, but what we really never want to be is a, in a place where the, 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 the person has a problem and that problem is being exacerbated. And we think the technology can do a lot to help us make sure that we better understand when people exhibit some issues and how we can do something to help them before they actually have problems. AI is significant in responsible gaming. We're seeing what they're doing at UNLV with yes. Kazra and doing some exciting research yeah. and, and with the payments side, mm -hmm. uh, how they're collaborating mm -hmm. to improve responsible gaming yes. and making sure that the guest has a better experience. Yeah, I, th I think we need to evolve. You know, the, I think that the one, th the one common element of this industry is it's in constant state of evolution, right? I mean, from the time when you know, all the slot machines paid out in quarters, and mm -hmm. somebody said, "Well, this is crazy. Why can't we just have a you know ticket in, ticket out, and then they can get paid at the cashier?" And the industry, you know, there were people that were resistant to that. And then, all right, well, what about digital payments? And you know, how can we introduce that into the industry? You know, some regulators were uncomfortable, legislators were uncomfortable, banks, you know, uh, processors, you know, all had some levels of hesitation, and we had to work to overcome those pieces. As we continue to evolve what the game, what the consumer wants, and ultimately, as an industry, we have to be where the consumer is, right? If we want to be successful, and so. AI and technology are keys to making sure that we are staying with the customer and not falling behind. Mm -hmm. Great, great, Bill. Um, before we say farewell, yeah. any final thoughts either about uh, Macau, G2E here this year or things moving forward, what to uh, be excited look, about? Look, I'm always excited about the industry. Uh, I think that the one thing is that we are, constant in a, we are in a constant state of motion. We're continuing to look for the next thing. I think it's one of the great, great opportunity, the great showcases that G2E creates, whether it's in Asia or it's in Las Vegas. It really brings the best new pieces of innovation from our industry so that People that are selling that innovation and people that want to buy that innovation are able to come together and really have successfully, you know, come to Macau or come to Las Vegas. It's and true. So, you can feel it. Yeah. The, the buzz is here. The energy's back. Yeah. Bill, thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. And for those watching, uh, all the information about AGA's Responsible Gaming Month in yeah. September will be listed there in the description. Great.